Hi, good evening. I'm Ilana Gadish, Yoetzer Halakha in Los Angeles, and tonight we have the privilege of um, hearing from Dr. Platt and Dr. Posey, uh, both who are maternal fetal medicine specialists who uh, both work clinically and in their research on the topic of preconception genetic testing. And we are lucky uh, really to have them both here. They are experts in their field and um, are going to share with us the cutting edge technology and background for preconception genetic testing. Um, before we begin the sort of medical portion of our evening, um, I wanted to give us a little bit of a framework uh, to sort of place us in the, um, in the frame of mind of how preconception genetic testing uh, connects to um, our Torah lives, uh, our, our lives of halacha and Jewish law. And um, actually, just before I begin, I'll mention that uh, all of our bios, if you scroll down on the socio platform, um, are available to you. If you want to click on them, uh, it'll show um, Dr. Platt and Dr. Posey's um, full bios, uh, and you'll really see how lucky we are to have them tonight uh, teaching us and educating us on this topic. Um, so, you know, before, as early as Sefer Bereshit, um, with Yaakov Avinu and his livestock, uh, we see that um, Jewish thinkers and halachists have been aware of how our traits are passed on in some way, and maybe they didn't have the framework of the word genetically, but passed on from generation to generation. Um, but uh, the story really um, became sort of the most halachically interesting in the 70s when a question was posed to Rav Moshe Feinstein in 1973 in a very famous tshuva in his Igrot Moshe about whether or not um, it is allowed to, whether or not an individual is allowed to do carrier testing, and you will hear all about that, basically preconception genetic testing, testing an individual to find out if they are a carrier for a particular disease. Um, in this case, the disease was Tay-Sachs, uh, a uh, common in the Ashkenazi uh, community, and you'll hear more from them about the medical side from Dr. Posey and Dr. Platt. Uh, but in the Igro Moshe, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein was asked whether or not it was allowed, uh, whether people who were single were allowed to test themselves before marriage. And, um, you know, it's a fascinating chuva. We're not going to do it inside, but um, I want to point out one element of the chuva uh, since, you know, obviously, uh, especially in the field of genetics, science and technology and medicine have evolved, you know, tremendously since the 70s. And so some people say maybe this chuva isn't even so relevant nowadays in terms of the practical, technical details of the, you know, of what testing they were doing and how much testing they were doing. But I think a certain fundamental point that Rav Moshe Feinstein um, raises is really important for us. Um, he raises a, a question of whether or not um, an understanding of a particular verse in the Torah uh, would indicate that we shouldn't do genetic testing. And that verse is here, Sefer Dvarim, Perak Yochet, Pasuk Yud Gimel. Um, and the, the words in the Pasuk are, Tamim Tihiyah Im Hashem Elokecha. You shall be wholehearted with Hashem, your God. Uh, and Tamim can mean uh, whole and complete, but it also can uh, indicate sort of an element of uh, innocence or simplicity. Uh, and not in a negative way, in a beautiful way. And as Rashi interprets this verse, uh, as Rav Moshe brings in the tshuva, he says we should walk with Hashem in purity, hope for him, and not to investigate into the future. So Rav Moshe says uh, someone might think that genetic testing or carrier testing could be a violation of the understanding of the Pesuk in this way. Should we not try to figure out our genetic future? Should we not investigate too much um, into, you know, our DNA and our genetics and what we're carriers for. Um, and Rav Moshe ruled very clearly and very strongly that um, we must test for, and in this case, he was talking about Tay-Sachs, we must test to see if we are carriers for this disease. And he says very strongly that if we do not check ourselves for this disease, it is, or for as being a carrier to this disease, which we'll uh, hear about and understand what exactly that means. Rav Moshe says, it is like closing one's eye to see what is possible to see. 
כסגירת העיניים לראות מה שאפשר לראות. That when we have the ability to find out and know something that we can see that is going to prevent tremendous, tremendous suffering, pain and illness, we have an obligation to do so. Um, and I think that this, the, uh, this fundamental point and whether or not we test in the same way we did in the past and whether or not uh, closed carrier testing like Doria Sharon, which uh, Rav Moshe was a proponent of, um, or open testing, you know, those details are to be talked about in, in our modern era. And we'll hear more about them from our prof- medical professionals. But the, the idea, the notion that we should, um, we should have knowledge of our medical health in a sense that what we can know and what we can use to help us live happy and healthy lives and our future generations to live happy and healthy lives, um, it, it's incumbent upon us to do so. And I think it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful way to start um, this evening to, to really see that beautiful point that we're not, um, you know, taking on some sort of divine status, uh, but rather we're really partners with Hashem in um, ensuring our health and ensuring our, our, um, our lives are as healthy as we can possibly make them. And I won't do this midrash inside, but there's a famous midrash where Turnus Rufus um, asks Rabbi Akiva, whose actions are greater, God's or man's? And, um, and Rabbi Akiva surprisingly uh, responds to him that man's actions are greater than Hashem. And of course, it seems like, of course, Rabbi Akiva believes that Hashem Hashem's actions are greater than man, but, you know, he's in this uh, conversation with Turnus Rufus, and, um, and he asks Rabbi Akiva, you know, why are you circumcised? If Hashem is so great, wouldn't he have created um, man to be already circumcised? Why do humans have to come along and circumcise their sons, or Jews have to come along and circumcise their sons? Isn't that in some way indicating that you don't believe Hashem's creations are perfect? And Rabbi Akiva responds to him by bringing him stalks of wheat and a loaf of bread. Um, and the metaphor is clear. Um, stalks, of, stalks of wheat are obviously not as good as a fresh loaf of bread. Um, and the point being that uh, Rabbi Akiva, the last line that he says is that the, the mitzvot that Hashem gave to us um, are to become partners with Hashem. And that when we take wheat and we turn it into bread, that's not a violation of our trust in Hashem or our belief in Hashem. Rather, it is us partnering with Hashem to create um, something beautiful in this world. And that that is, um, that is our role um, in, in, this, uh, in this life. And in a sense, I think that this can really connect back to preconception genetic testing because we are partnering, partnering with Hashem to, um, to really bring that uh, healthiest possible future uh, for ourselves and for our families and for our community. Um, as we move forward through, uh, you know, this advancing world of medical technology, which is so incredible, and we are going to hear about right now. So, Dr. Posey, why don't you talk to us about what is carrier screening? What are we actually talking about? Preconception genetic testing. Um, Take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Alana. And uh, just a quick also thank you to all of you who are watching and joining us. We really appreciate being able to have a conversation with you tonight. Of course, thank you to Nishmat for this fantastic program. And just a, a really a, a kind of a, a quick apology to everybody. Um, I am uh, streaming to you from the hospital in my office because I have to manage a patient in labor. So I apologize for the sweatshirt attire. It's sort of covering my scrubs, um, but that's what I have to be in to be in labor and delivery. So um, what is carrier screening? We're gonna start with a little bit, um, kind of a little bit of, of basic genetics and a little bit of history to kind of take us through where we started and where we are. Um, Genetic diseases really are very vast and numerous. Um, There are anywhere between six to 7,000 single gene disorders and they they comprise a reasonable amount of infant deaths. We are not giving you this number in any means uh, to scare people or to frighten or to sort of turn people away. In fact, really quite the opposite. We're trying to give these statistics because essentially one in 300 pregnancies are affected, meaning everyone has got something. It might be different than the person next door, it might be the same as the person next door, but really everybody's got something. 
recess and so sort of it's highlighting the importance for us um, about testing because as we'll get to what a, a gene disorder when you are a carrier it is something called recessive and those can pass down very quietly for many generations so some diseases a person manifests clinically and you know you have it when you're a carrier it means that you have the proclivity to passing it to a future generation, even if you personally do not manifest the condition. So therefore, carriers can often have family histories that are devoid of the disorder because it really takes another partner to, who also is a carrier to have an affected child. Next slide. So carrier screening is a particular type of genetic test where we look at genes or sort of our DNA, kind of the instructions or the coding book that's in our bodies in order to be able to evaluate whether or not there's some sort of damaged gene. And again, this is checking to see if someone is a carrier. So the person being screened is not somebody who is manifesting any clinical disease. It's not somebody who is hurting or in pain or has signs or symptoms. This is silent. So we are testing a person who is ostensibly facing us, looking healthy, and we're looking to see if they have some damage in their DNA that could get passed on to a future generation. Now we're really gonna highlight diseases that require carrier status by the father and the mother in order to manifest, um, but it is important to know that there are certain conditions that really can manifest with just one copy, but that's not really the primary um, discussion for us tonight. Next slide. So what we're gonna highlight again is this um, idea of what's called an autosomal recessive condition, and you'll see those words um, spelled out in the next slide, so don't worry if you don't know how to spell that. Um, and it's basically when two parents, so a father and a mother, are carriers of the same genetic condition. So let's say the mom's a carrier for Tay-Sachs, the dad's a carrier for Tay-Sachs. Then the child has a 25% chance, or a one in four. So each pregnancy, not total across all pregnancies, but every pregnancy, that child has a one in four chance of being affected with Tay-Sachs because they got the carrier um, gene from their mom, they got the other gene from their dad, now they've got two copies, and now with two abnormal copies, they now manifest the condition. That's a one in four chance. They have a 50% chance of actually continuing to be a carrier. So they won't manifest the disease, but they could pass it on to a future generation. In the next slide, we're gonna show you here pictorially what we're talking about. And as you see here on the right, there is a father and a mother. And again, the moms and dads are in these two different color greens because they're each carriers. And as you can see, the little girl all the way on the right is, is um, un unaffected, that's 25%. The little boy all the way on the left is affected, that's again, one in four. And the middle boys and girls are not clinically affected, meaning they, they don't manifest the Tay-Sachs condition, they are ostensibly healthy, but they are carrying the gene and could pass it on to a future generation. Next slide. So now the question is, what do we do when we have this fictitious couple, Sarah and Avraham? The two of them want to start a family together. And now we're trying to be able to counsel them as what are their options in order to determine their genetic risk. Next slide. So one of the first organizations that really helped with preconception genetic risk uh, reduction was Doria Sharim. And really kudos to them, and Alana mentioned um, them back at, uh, regarding the Chuva with, with Rav Moshe. They were very much pioneers. It was a private, right? Um, it was individuals had unique identifying numbers. So the individuals got blood drawn through Doria Sharim, and then Doria Sharim sort of kept them in an identifying number. And then when they wanted to, um, sometimes it was before they were going to go on a date or maybe when they were already planning to get married, before they were going to get married, at some point they would contact Doria Sharm for their, for, their, for their intended partner. And Doria Sharm would tell them if there was a match or no match. So certainly that was very helpful for many couples. Um, and in fact, it did actually reduce a number of conditions like Tay-Sachs. There, there was a decline. But there were some challenges uh, because no genetic information was given. 
So if I was in Dori Sharim and I called them and I wanted to be with, if Sarah, let's call me Sarah, and she wanted to, to um, start a family with Avraham, they would call Dori Sharim and Dori Sharim would say, Sarah, you're not a match. Sarah would not know if she had a problem or if Avraham had a problem. She didn't know what the problem was, whether it was Tay-Sachs or cystic fibrosis or familial dysautonomia or any other of the myriad conditions. She didn't know maybe it was more than one, maybe it was two things. So there was certainly this challenge because individuals didn't have control of their own genetic information. And there was also a bit of a stigma when a girl or a boy would get told no match. You know, did other people now want to date them? Maybe they were somehow tainted. So again, um, you can push one more. Yeah, this was definitely very, very helpful for couples. Again, it did help decrease the incidence of Tay-Sachs, um, but it had some challenges and we've certainly come a long way. Next slide. This is a super abbreviated genetic testing timeline, but just to kind of give a quick pictorial snapshot, you can see where we've come from the 1960s when we start with amniocentesis and then Tay-Sachs cystic fibrosis screening. We have very um, specific Jewish panels for testing. And now we're actually at the point where we can even test um, over 500 different genes with just one little sample. Next slide. For the next few slides I'm gonna show you are just examples. Um, I, these are from three different companies. These are not intended to be branded. We just really just picked kind of a sampling so to be able to show you the types of screening that's out there. But you can see here on the right, there are panels out there now that are specialized to Ashkenazi Jews. Simple blood test, no special referral, even covered by most insurances. And here this one tests for 48 genes. Next slide. You've got the next one here, which is 144 genes. You can see you can't even read it because I had to shrink it so much to fit on the slide. Next one. You've got another panel that's got 176 genes. Again, all of these are things that, like I mentioned before, that are autosomal recessive. So you can be a carrier that's silent. If the father and the mother are each a carrier for this, then their uh, child is at risk for having the condition, a one in four chance. Next slide. We're lucky to have programs that really spe uh, specialize in Jewish screening. So there are, there are companies like JScreen, uh, website is up on the board there. They also test for a, a very specified group of specific Ashkenazi um, and general Jewish genes. Next slide. And here, this is what I had mentioned about, there are very expanded panels available now that even can test up to 500. This really isn't the right forum for us to discuss whether or not you sort of should get 500 just because, it, because it's available. But the point that we're trying to convey is the amount of information that is available out there. All these different options, multiple different panels um, that gives us a lot more information than what we could have gotten with Doria Sharm um, a couple of decades ago. One more slide. So actually, I think, um, so the criteria for carrier screening, and then I'm going to hand this off to Dr. Platt. But as I mentioned, again, there's a lot of different tests out there. A lot of different genes are on those slides. And the question is, how do they determine what gets on there? And um, criteria are that there has to be a good test available, right? So we've got to be able to know and ascertain if somebody has or does not have the damaged gene. The disorder has to be common enough that it will affect a reasonable amount of people. And it doesn't have to be as common as something like cystic fibrosis. It can be one of the you know, mucolipidoses, which most people may have never heard of, but common enough. It has to be severe, um, right? If it's just a, a gene that talks about eye color, it's not really worth it. Whether your child has blue, green, or two different color eyes, it doesn't really matter, right? It's gotta be something that's fairly clinically significant. We would like for there to be an intervention that if we know about, about the condition, we can help prevent or mitigate. And of course, the testing has to be voluntary. Patients must uh, proceed only after informed consent. So with that, I'm gonna um, advance slide and hand it off to Dr. Platt to discuss now about who should be screened and what they should do with that information. I think you're muted still. 
There we go. I'm, I'm not often muted, so I, yeah, I don't even think of that. So I want to thank uh, uh, Nishmat and Robinson Haken, uh, Tara Ice for their coordination of this wonderful uh, three days, four days actually of, of education symposium and material that's really important to all of us and all of our families and locally to Alana for uh, bringing us together and preparing this for you this evening. I don't think uh, we mentioned earlier that there will be plenty of time for questions. You should put uh, the questions in the chat box and we will answer them at the end. I have uh, a number of slides to go over that will really uh, elaborate what Hindi has spoken about. Uh, it's very clear that both of us see patients every day and, and deal with this every single day in our practice. And um, we hope that we can share some of that with you. So who should be screened and what do we want to do with that information? A very, very important aspect for a, a firm couple to go through when uh, they're pregnant and wanting to know what's gone or even before they get pregnant because they're options. So I think as you heard, carrier screening involves taking a sample of blood, saliva, tissue from inside the cheek, a buckle smear. Very easy for us to obtain this information today without really an unboard burden on someone to be able to have it. We also want to say who should be tested first. There are many people who think both the couples should be tested, but you certainly can begin with one of the couples because if they have no findings, if there are really no mutations, then the likelihood of a problem is very small. I want to add one uh, caveat to that, is that some of the testing schemes don't do what we call deep sequencing. And that means that they look for common mutations. Some of these diseases like cystic fibrosis particularly have very unusual mutations that aren't screened for in some of the common panels. So if someone has had a CF screen that's negative, and you'll hear me comment later about false positives and false negatives, it may very well be that a baby could theoretically have cystic fibrosis because one of the couples had one of these very rare mutations that are not screened for on the quote screening test. This is exactly why it's called a screening test and not a diagnostic test. And let's remember those differences are very important. So as we look at the approaches that we're gonna take with carrier screening, we're gonna take two approaches, a targeted screening and expanded carrier screening, which Hindi's already alluded to. The targeted screening are gonna be for someone who's known to be a carrier for something and go deeper into that to get those things that we want, or for example, the Jewish panel that may be, and we'll look at that. Next slide, please. So if we look at targeted, it's going to be based on ethnicity or family history, as I said. And I think that this is probably when we talk about the Jewish screen, that's the ethnicity screen that we have. Uh, and a family history, we're going to screen for specific genetic disorders that may have been rare. But today we can know a lot more about what causes those rare abnormalities in, a, in an offspring. If we look back when Doria Shoram just started, most of these things were not available. We, we have gone so far ahead in genetic understanding, particularly since the Human Genome Project, that we can really understand things way ahead of time. And as you'll see in a moment, there are things we actually can do about it to prevent the baby from having this by some of the new reproductive, uh, uh, assisted reproductive technologies that we have available today. Next slide, please. So these are the different types. It's not just the Jews. We're not the chosen people because we have all these diseases and understanding that a lot of these uh, aspects of things that happen to us are uh, really what we call founder genes, if you think about what that comes, because we, we, we inbreed a lot. So if we have a rare abnormality and what's going to happen is we're going to keep that up in our own population group because we marry within our own population. And therefore, we're talking about, as you heard before, the autosomal recessive disorder. We have the greater chance of having an offspring because we have the patients who have that same abnormality. But there are others as well. Don't think that Tay-Sachs can only occur to Jews. For example, it's very common in French Canadians. It can also be uh, in Cajun people, well, Louisiana Cajun people. So understand that we need to know all these ethnic variations that can affect testing. The most common uh, genetic disease in the carrier screening world for Caucasians is cystic fibrosis. And we're Caucasian, so we can get that as well. It's not necessarily a ethnic one for us, but it really has to do with our, our being Caucasian that's there. Next slide, please. So if you're going to offer testing, and again, I think that uh, Hindi spoke about this a little earlier, but this is a really important point. 
you have to understand that some conditions before you get tested may not be very well characterized. So you're not gonna really test for them. Some are very rare and we don't even know the detection rate. We don't know the residual risk. When you get tested, you get given a risk of something. And if you're negative, there'll be a residual risk because we pointed out that not everything can be found on a carrier screen. So there is no test that we have that can rule out all genetic diseases. And I think we have to understand that carrier testing is not the diagnostic test, as I said earlier. So remember that if you've had carrier screening and unfortunately something had happened and you had an offspring that had a problem, then you can see that that may be because there was either a false negative or a false positive test, or you had a rare mutation that was not detectable on the traditional carrier screens that we have. Next slide, please. So again, important for screening and actually for even diagnostic tests. Every test is gonna have a certain false negative rate. And that is you have a gene for the disorder that was not detected, but you had a negative test. Not uncommon with some of these diseases, unfortunately. A false positive, that scares a lot of our patients. We have screening populations, and I'm sure many of you out there have been screened and, and had uh, you were screening in, in state screening, for example, for uh, Down syndrome, and you screened positive, and you didn't have a baby with Down syndrome. They, a certain cutoff is given on sensitivity and specificity, which we're not going to get into this, but I think it's very clear that uh, uh, you can't automatically think if you have a positive test that you have a baby that has an abnormality. Next slide. So as we look at how we test, whether you screen for one, where you screen for the 143, or just a Genu uh, Jewish panel, as Hindi has pointed out to us, and or you're going to do the expanded one for the 500 because that's what you wanna do. We know today that the way genetics has gone, we have created a more cost-effective approach with multiplex panel screening, which allows us to test for more than one thing at a time. And that is why these prices have come down significantly. I just wanna point out that for these tests that are not necessarily inexpensive, they cost, but if you look at what you're getting, you're getting a lot for your value. I would encourage everyone to not only present your insurance to your, care, your healthcare provider, but you can ask whether they have special rates and special discounts on that because almost every single company will work with you on what you can afford to get these tests done. Next slide, please. Here's some examples of mild or minimal non-disorders. What do I mean by that? And I think this is really important about what we understand about carrier screening. Carrier screening can actually test for a lot of things. Some of the things on the 500 disease panel are not really significant clinically. They're manageable. And they're not even, you won't even detect it on the child. For example, hemochromatosis is, has to do with inappropriate absorption of iron. So there's too much iron around. And, and for the difference, there's a difference between a man and a woman. The woman who menstruates will lose some of that iron so she won't have an overaccumulation. Not a, necessarily a very significant problem for some. MTHFR, which is another one of these uh, things that we can screen for, they're, they're, they're not really significant. We can treat them without any consequences to, to the children. And so that's why you gotta be careful what you get nervous about when you see you screen for something because it may not be significant at all. So we gotta remember, just because we can, doesn't mean we should. And it doesn't mean we should offer that all the time. A lot of the times when someone screens positive, that's when you want to get partner screening. Now, one concern that I have sometimes about not doing it together is the delay. The delay in getting that information is important. And to me, if you're doing it preconceptually, this is fantastic. That is the best way to do it because you have plenty of time to do something about it, which we'll address in just a few moments. So if someone is late to the game and gets it done while they're pregnant, that's a very different aspect of when you can do something about it and should know that ahead of time. So in prenatal diagnosis, which is the world that I live in, we are taught and we emphasize first do no harm. So before you start testing, know when you're testing and how to do it. Next slide, please. Tay-Sachs, we're not gonna go into length, but there's two methods to detect it. One is the enzyme method, and the other is mutation analysis. They're not always the same result. I can tell you that we just had a patient uh, this week who screened negative on the mutation, but actually she had a, a, an enzyme abnormality that would have put the patient at risk if her partner had tested positive. 
So her question was, how come I tested positive, negative before and positive now? And again, it's because there's two different methodologies that we can test for these things that really make a difference. I think that we know about Tay-Sachs, which has been a phenomenal success if we talk about screening, and particularly in our population, because we've almost eradicated disease by preparing ahead of time and knowing what we can do about that for those who carry the gene and they have a partner that carries a gene as well. Next slide, please. So my test result shows I'm a carrier. Now what? What can you do? One, we always emphasize referred to a genetic counselor and for counseling. Don't just have a test done without that informed consent that Hindi talked about before. Dr. Posey was absolutely right. Your physician should discuss what they're testing you for and understand that before you accept testing. All too often, we see couples come in who have just had a test done, did not know what it was for, and now the next step, they're with a puzzle. What do they do? That's particularly germane to uh, our population, religious couples, who then have a very difficult time. What do they do next? Do they intervene? How do they intervene and what they do? So a lot of this has to do with not just the genetic counselor. You have to ask your halakhic uh, advisor as well, the, the Rav, uh, you can, uh, you, set, you can ask those that are knowledgeable to have you understand what is going on. A normal test is really good news. But again, as I said earlier, it's not perfect. and not going to identify all carriers, but it's certainly better than having none of those tests being done. Next slide. So if your partner and you are both carriers, you have multiple choices. In the general population, uh, we believe that the carrier screening is best performed before you get pregnant. And therefore, you have the following opportunities. In the general population, you can choose and the front population use IVF with PGT, which is uh, prenatal genetic testing. There's several types of testing that go on. There's an A, there's a, there's a, a screening methodology that go on with it. There's specific targeted, but it's, it, it takes a, a right, what we call a probe to be able to identify that in the single cell. It's only one cell that they test and manage it, but that will prevent that the conception of an abnormal fetus. Others in the general population may choose to have donor eggs or sperm to get pregnant. Um, you can get pregnant and have diagnostic tests to see if the fetus has a disorder. And this presentation is not dealing with termination of pregnancy. There was an earlier uh, seminar last night, which you can look at the, uh, uh, the taping of it, which is on the uh, Nishmat site, uh, which discusses those opportunities and the, the halachic uh, concerns. Uh, you may choose not to get pregnant. This may have been your fourth pregnancy and you decided not to, or you can choose to adopt a child. But if you have screening after you get pregnant, your options are definitely limited. And that's why consulting your physician, your healthcare provider, uh, your genetic counselor for a different, uh, different information concerning what you can do is very important. But again, seeking the halakhic advice regarding these options really is essential for our community. Next slide. Are the results carrier screening private? There's been many concerns by many of our patients. Well, I don't want to do that because if I screen positive, I'm not going to get insurance. 2008, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act came out and made it very clear that your health insurance cannot, cannot, and I emphasize it time and again, uh, change or hold back any insurance carry coverage for yourself because you're a carrier. It is illegal for employers to discriminate uh, against employees because of genetic information. Uh, it doesn't apply to life insurance. You can't know, find out that you have something significant or your child has something significant and get life insurance on it. That's an integrity issue, of course. But I think it's important to know you should feel very comfortable because we are all protected by these laws that do not allow discrimination against us if we carry any of these mutations or changes that are there. So I think you can get plenty of guidance from plenty of people around you, but again, before you sign on to this, make sure you understand what you're getting into. Next slide. And my final thoughts is, in this regard, is the uh, m foremost purpose of prenatal screening is not to reduce the incidence of genetic disorders, but to fulfill a couple's reproductive goals, as Peter Rowley said uh, years ago. It's very clear we're not on a search and destroy mission. We're here to create healthy pregnancies, healthy families, 
uh, you know, the, to create the essence of Peru Avu, uh, and as we really have that opportunity to do it with a within the framework of halacha that allows us to look forward to take what we know today, the advances that we have been fortunately given, and as you heard Ilana beautifully illustrate very at the opening beginning, these are our opportunities from Hashem that we can really take hold of this new information and create a, a society uh, that will advance our knowledge, advance our children's knowledge, and be successful along the ways. I'm sure now we'll have time for questions. Again, put them in the questions answer box and uh, Alana will uh, uh, take control of that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Platt. Um, so we have some questions here um, in the Q&A and please, um, as you're listening, if, you, if anything comes up, if anything comes to mind, put them in the chat and if some are similar, we'll try to uh, combine the questions. Um, okay. Um, would you recommend testing before getting married or after you have found your partner or rather before you find a partner, you're single, you're dating, whatever it might be, or after you've found your partner and you're uh, planning your family? Let, let me try to answer that in, in, a, in a really important way. And I think if you see what we knew when Doria Shorter first came out and whether you really liked what they were doing with holding information or not, it allowed so many people to be tested. But it was limited at the time. It was limited to four or five things that we can test for. As you heard, Dr. Posey said, Tay Sachs, uh, familial dysautonomia at the time called Riley Day, uh, Canavan syndrome, cystic fibrosis. Look at today, there's over 500 and there's gonna be more. So things that can be very relevant as we talked about, things that, that will make a difference, things that are really catastrophic illnesses that we can prevent, I think are very important to say, hold off a little bit. Don't do it when you're 17. It, not going to be the same if you're 22 or if you're 19. The advances are coming every single day. And within a year and a half ago, you couldn't get 500. And so within that 500, there are some significant diseases that may very well make a difference. So I, I'm a believer of waiting, uh, not until you're pregnant, but really waiting until you have your partner and you're getting married and you really want to know what you could do once you're planning to get pregnant. Yeah, I'll jump back onto that. I, I really um, appreciate all of Dr. Platt's points and I agree. I think just to add on is that, remember, carrier screening is testing something that is not manifesting now. So waiting doesn't mean that you are pushing off important genetic, important health information. It's not manifesting, it's not mm -hmm. a danger to you, it's only a danger of uh, potential for reproduction. And so as Dr. Platt mentioned, the GINA law, again, this is um, specific for America. I know there are folks here um, from other countries, but at least in America, the GINA law does not allow discrimination by employment or by health. However, life insurance, disability insurance can be affected. And typically speaking, when people are 17, they're not buying life insurance. So a lot of folks may wanna wait until they're married and actually buy their life insurance policies I mean, anticipation of having children when they're young and the policies are still cheap and then sort of get that testing and then make decisions thereafter. So just a number of, um, you know, sort of things to think, keep in mind. The, the last one I would mention is again, when people get testing young, Dory Sharm was very cautious about this, but when you get testing young, uh, there can be stigma. If somebody finds out that you're a carrier screening for X, Y, or Z condition, um, sometimes that can become a little black, black, dot, you know, on the shidduch market. And we we do want to be careful and cautious that not everybody is always very, is, is very well informed about what carrier screening is. Back to our initial slide, everybody's got something. Um, there really shouldn't be a taint on anybody for being a carrier. Everybody is a carrier for something. It's just sort of a matter of, you know, what and when. And we really don't want to put more stress on people as they're trying to find their life mate. Uh, we want to make less. And I, Great, I, always tell, I always tell people that uh, we all have something, as, as Dr. Posey just said, hideous. If one looks at my hair, I have a white streak here. I've had that white streak since I'm 20, but so does my sister. So I know we, I don't know what the gene is, but we all have something. Thank you. That's, um, uh, I'm sorry, you cut out there for a second. I think, um, we can move to the next question. So um, how often, uh, you know, 
I'll combine some questions. How often should a couple be retesting? Uh, someone asked, if I did Doria Sharon 15 years ago, should I retest? Or if I did testing for a child who is now six years old, do I need to retest again? Uh, how often should a couple be retesting? I think, again, this uh, speaks to the advancement of science in, uh, in every year, minute, month. I'll just say, because I just went through it with my own children, asking that very same question, uh, who were tested earlier. Um, this is now their, their third, it's one of my uh, grandchildren to be, but uh, I think very clearly, I, and I don't hide it, I, I encourage them to retest because the, the panel is very different. And on that larger panel, there were things that were significant that they could prevent and do something about. Uh, for Hashem, it was fine. Uh, and there was nothing significant, uh, but uh, I don't think they should do it every year. I think, yeah, again, that's what informed consent is all about. Here's what we know today. Here's what we can find out tomorrow about it. This is what you had before. So it's important for you to keep a record of what you had and that testing. You know, today with, with uh, your own uh, portals, it, it's a lot easier to do that. Um, you can check it and check what's on there. But I can tell you, if you see some of the companies that were listed earlier, uh, they started off with very few screening tests. Uh, and one company acquires another company, another company markets another product. But if you keep your own record of what you have, then you can compare what's available. And with your healthcare provider, do an analysis whether there are things that are significant enough that you would do something about. Many of these diseases on the new panel, you may not do anything about, which with we pointed out earlier. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Um, and I guess connected to that, I did ancestry.com or I did 23andMe. Is that the same thing as carrier testing? Do I still need to do carrier testing? You know, what's, what's that all about? Go ahead, Andy. No, I'll, I'll let you keep, keep finishing. I'll, I'll do the next one. <laughs> okay. The answer is it's not, again, when I talked about how genetics works and, and what sequencing does, um, it's not as deep as what you're getting in, in some of these screening technologies. So it's going to miss some things. There's no question about it. And, and we've had experiences where patients relied on it, thought that was good enough. And unfortunately for them, it, it wasn't. So uh, while they're, they're pretty good and pretty cost effective to get that information, they don't replace classical carrier screening that you now have available to your physician's offices. And I'll, I'll just add to that, that for carrier screening, again, obviously every insurance is different, so you have to check with your insurance, but a lot of insurances do cover it. So it's not really that much out of pocket expense. And for those um, women who, or couples, I should say, who don't ha who have insurance that don't cover it, a lot of the companies have uh, deals where they'll, you know, they won't charge you more than X amount, you know, $100, $200, et cetera. So again, that's why it's really important to talk to the genetic counselors, to your physicians. Um, if you go to physicians that do this all the time, they they have relationships with the reps from the companies and they can, they can get these to be very cost effective. Thanks, Dr. Bogue. I think you once said a great line that the cost of, um, whatever cost that the testing might cost, even if you don't have insurance is, um, and especially since they do do deals, um, is going to be far cheaper than the cost of, you know, caring for an affected child and the emotional cost of, um, of having to go through the turmoil of, of making really tough decisions that can be uh, mitigated in many cases when, when we do do um, preconception testing. So I, I really like that. It really stuck with me yeah. um, when you said that. Thank you. Okay. So, um, can you elaborate more on PGT and IVF? What's the difference between PGT and PGD? And can you do PGT or PGD without doing IVF? So pre-implantation genetic testing um, it really dovetails with, with IVF, right? So essentially what pre-implantation gen genetic testing is, is that there is um, retrieval of of eggs from the woman, retrieval of sperm from a male, those two are incubated together and form an embryo. And then the embryo is allowed to uh, divide into a number of cells, something called a blastocyst. And then in special laboratories, a, um, a specialized scientist 
removes just one little cell from this blastocyst. So the, all the blastocyst cells are the same, um, but the scientist removes one cell from that blastocyst and then sends it off for testing and basically tests the DNA um, for the specific condition um, at, at you know, sort of at, at issue. So as an example, let's say um, to Sarah and Avraham, just to continue with their example, they're both carriers for Tay-Sachs. So they have a one in four chance if they were to not do any testing, a one in four chance of their child having Tay-Sachs, obviously a very morbid and debilitating condition. And so they do the sort of standard IVF cycles through all of that, you know, medications, injections, everything that people have heard about in other lectures and um, probably through friends or whatnot. And then they test one of the cells from that blastocyst, and then they look at the DNA and look specifically for the Tay-Sachs. And if that, um, if each of those embryos, that one cell does not have Tay-Sachs, then that cell is considered clean for Tay-Sachs. Whereas um, if a cell shows that it has Tay-Sachs and that embryo is marked as affected, and when they then um, implant the embryo into the woman to be able to impregnate her, they're obviously going to implant just the embryos that were unaffected from the condition. So they're not, the important thing is that we're not testing the entire DNA for every condition possible on that cell. We are just testing for the specific condition at which this embryo is at risk based on the results of the carrier testing. So again, if the patient and the, her partner, Sarah and Avraham, are carriers for Tay-Sachs, we're testing that embryo, that cell, for, for Tay-Sachs. We're not testing it for everything else. Let, let, let right. me also, let me just add one comment about the, it, again, we ask about PGT. There, that is specific, that's diagnostic, because we're looking for one specific thing. There's some screening that can be done as well for common aneuploidies like Down syndrome, trisomy 21, trisomy 13, trisomy 18. But it's not going to cover the whole gamut, as Hindi has just alluded to. Right. Thank I, you. That's I, so helpful. Yeah. And I think people often ask about this, you know, is there is there the possibility of it ever being a mistake? And, you know, um, it's kind of like anything. Nothing's 100%. It's a really, really good test. It, it is really close to 100%, but unfortunately it's not. Um, we've all taken care, I know Dr. Platt has taken care of, I've taken care of, we've all taken care of patients where they did IVF, they did PGT, again, testing for Downs or trisomy 18, 13, they did um, PGD for the Tay-Sachs, and long behold, the child that they have is affected with, with something that they thought they tested negative. So there are a number of reasons for that. Um, there's something called mosaic. There is occasionally lab errors. There are a number of reasons that these can occur, um, but vast, vast, vast majority of the time, it is it is reliable. Yeah, and, and one of the things patients often ask me, uh, particularly if come with IVF and they had PGT, uh, and we might see something on ultrasound. Well, I had PGT, how come I'm seeing something? What's the risk there? Because in those cases, there's still a chance that something else is going on. Uh, not that the test necessarily is false negative for what they have because they have something else going on and it may be unrelated to that. And let's be realistic. These are patients that are very risk averse. Even though we talk about amniocentesis and CVS as having a low risk, it's a risk that a lot of patients don't want to take because they've been through so much to get this pregnancy and an expense that we all know is not reasonable here in the United States for sure. So. Think about it that way. There are things that, that can be done. Uh, we can further test them, and that has been done by some patients, particularly we see something different in ultrasound. But as Indy has just said, you know, it's one cell. It's a pretty good test when you think about it. Thanks. So, um, so for from couples who are carriers, both carriers for a particular disease, um, I know we had some specific, uh, you know, disease specific questions, but I'll, I'll sort of generalize it. Um, would you say that if the couple is, is um, ideally wants to use both of their genetic material, IVF, inter, uh, IVF with PGT would be their ideal um, option? And I guess I pose that as a yeah. question at the end there. I would, I would say, um, you know, again, it's going to depend on what the condition is, right? If we're talking about something, we sort of use Tay-Sex as the the, the, the the classic one. If we're talking about something like Tay-Sex, um, yes, 
you know, that's really going to be the preferred. I uh, can't can't pretend that there's there's not a lot of anxiety for a couple to have to navigate getting the results to have to navigate um, IVF. It is it's painful. It's emotionally hard. There are a lot of halakhic questions that come up. I know um, Alana has helped carry carry people through the IVF process. Um, I'm sure all the other Yoatzot and other locations have as well. There are bunny um, to whom to turn. There are plenty of from physicians, you know, who can help. But you know, it is definitely a long road. But for something like Tasex, that would be the preferred. If you know you happen to be a carrier for a condition again, because we're screening for 500 things, and like I said, I was being a little trivial when I said it's about eye color, but something that's more trivial, and you and your partner have thought about it, and it's not a big deal for you. If you know one in four your your child has it, then maybe you don't have to undergo that that road. But it really does need to be um, a thoughtful decision between the couple, use of your physicians, uh, your yoatso, your rabbinic authorities, you know, to really help guide. Let me add something. If we talk about advances and what where we've come from, one of the other things that we we haven't discussed thus far is treatment of some of these conditions has changed dramatically over time, and some of the things that we thought were very significant may be treatable today because of our advances. And that's going to come in a lot of ways. Not only fetal surgery, fetal intervention, which we're not talking about that. Although think about it, ultrasound is a screening test, sometimes a diagnostic test. But let's look at PKU, for example. We have many couples who, who have had children with uh, uh, phenylketonuria where, where diet has really helped keep these kids normal. Um, and so, and that's only because of the advances we've made in understanding that disease, that it becomes less significant of a disease if you only look historically and say, oh, it's a bad disease. And there are a lot of them, like Gaucher's disease. We have treatment for that as well, which hits the Jewish population for sure. So. Getting that information, asking your healthcare providers, is there any other place you can get resources? There's plenty of resources available. And I think the National Institute of Health uh, uh, is a wonderful site for these rare diseases that you may have encountered. Um, there's a lot of help out there. And I think that's a really important part for you to get this information. If you screen positive for one of these unusual ones that your healthcare provider may not be familiar with it. And that's where genetic counselors play a role because they can help you guide to those places as well. And if there's questions beyond that, of course, uh, seek help uh, from those most experienced. Thank you, Dr. Platt. And um, just to, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, genetic, uh, genetic counselors. Um, somebody asked, you know, uh, if you can elaborate a little bit on the genetic counseling field and, um, and, uh, how they what 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 role does a genetic counselor play uh, when you're working with your you know maternal fetal medicine specialist or with your OBGYN and with the testing? Um, how do how do all those parts kind of um, come together? Have, having worked with genetic counselors for my entire career, I can tell you they're an integral part of our team. Uh, and when you look at physician assistants, nurse practitioners. Um, ultrasound sonographers, uh, you know, the other that part play a part in healthcare team. Genetic counselor is a significant part of what we do. Uh, their responsibility is great. Their educational opportunities are phenomenal. They're always learning. Uh, they work very closely with medical geneticists. So there's, there's a team there as well. Um, they help interpret laboratory findings. Um, it's a great career to be very honest. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity to play an integral part in, in the management of healthcare. Uh, I think even more than some of the other fields that people are in in healthcare. And there are plenty of programs around the country uh, that offer genetic counseling uh, um, in almost every large city for sure and university. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and um, again, uh, I'll just reiterate as Dr. Platt said, because I see some more specific types of questions that if you um, if you do have a specific, if you know you and your partner are a specific carrier to reach out to your uh, medical provider and find out what types of treatments there are for uh, children affected with those diseases um, and uh, that there are many resources out there. Um, okay, so another question. Sounds like there's a fine line between the right amount of info and too much info. And not all of these diseases are so bad, right? So couldn't this induce anxiety if we're testing for too many things? 
I think that's a great question. And that's, you know, a, a bit what we were to what we were alluding when we mentioned that just because tests are out there doesn't mean we necessarily have to, to do all of them. So I think these are really important conversations to have. Again, as Dr. Platt and I both said, we, we both would agree that this is probably best done once you are together with your partner. So you have a support system. Together you decide um, on, on the testing. And you're gonna talk to a genetic counselor, you're gonna talk to a physician. Again, as uh, you'll talk to Rabinic, you'll, so you'll talk to different, different advisors. But I think um, it does become important. You can look at the different panels out there Sometimes you get a little bit um, sort of co cornered into a hole based on insurance uh, or based on ability to pay. Um, so sometimes that's kind of decided for you because of uh, the people, the, the companies with whom your insurance uh, provider contracts. Other times you have more options, but I think the notion of mental health and anxiety is not a small one. Um, it's really not to be minimized. And that's really, as Dr. Platt said, is, is really one of the huge benefits of genetic counseling. Um, I'm also of the opinion that people should not be getting genetic testing, whether it's carrier screening for preconception or honestly genetic testing for cancer uh, proclivities, really any genetic testing without proper counseling with a genetic counselor, because you want to know what this information means and what you can do with the information. Uh, some folks may choose to hold off if there's nothing they can do for five years, maybe they wanna wait five years. Um, it's really important to be able to understand how you're going to utilize the information. Certainly a very important point. I really agree with uh, Cindy. Thank you so much. Um, any um, final thoughts uh, before we wrap up? I just really want to thank, um, you know, Nishmat and all of the uh, Atara for putting this together and all the Yuatsot and Dr. Platt for being willing to be on a panel together with me. It's, uh, he's been a mentor of mine, so it's nice to be together with him. But I think this is such an important topic and I think it is such a such a demonstration of um, Nishmat's effect globally that they were able to put together this health and halacha conversation to really address a lot of important and private um, issues in women's health. Uh, women's health sometimes gets a little brushed under the rug and to be able to have a four-day conference all across the world with speakers and, and, and women, men, rabbis, doctors, genetic counselors, every, everybody coming together uh, is really such a beautiful thing. So thank you. And I'll, my closing remarks are, I think one of the key things that I've always learned in going to shul and looking at Top the Orange Kodesh you see many words and many different shuls have different things. I always like the one that says, Dalith name ato made. You know, we're in shul, we're fun of Hashem. But I also look at when I talk to people, when I talk to patients, you got to know who you're standing in front of. You got to know what you have to tell them. You have to calm them down. You have to take that mental part of it and part of it and have compassion as you discuss these very sensitive issues with them and make sure that they know that they're private and that's between you and them and they can ask you questions in the same way uh, that you Who's ever out there and has questions for us afterwards, I'm sure that Indy will say the same. Feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, you can get through us through Nishmat. Our emails, no problem at all. We're here to help whatever we can. And again, I want to close. Thank, thank uh, Nishmat for putting this on. It's a great thing. Atira for your efforts, for uh, Alana for your efforts, for uh, all the other co-sponsoring organizations. And I'll let Alana do those closing parts. But again, it's been an honor to participate in this, and I hope we do more of these in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're um, really grateful that Nishmat and Mizrahi Canada have uh, put this conference together. I'll, I'll just say, you know, somebody who has, uh, uh, sorry to, I mean, I don't, I, it's not a HIPAA violation for me as someone who's been a patient uh, and also feels that I am also a colleague and a friend. Um, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that you've joined, uh, joined me here tonight to share and elucidate and, and answer questions. As an educator at Eula Girls, I've seen my students look to both Dr. Posey and Dr. Platt with like, you know, with such awe and reverence. Um, and, you know, both times that I've seen you come in and speak to students and speak in front of students, you're so warm and inviting. And I'm sure all of the um, all of the people who have come tonight feel the same way. Uh, but I think it's a really beautiful thing also for people to see, um, you know, committed, observant, uh, inspired and connected um, Jewish individuals who are also experts at the top of their field. And I think that we're really, really lucky to be able to have that tonight um, in our session. So I, I'm feeling very grateful for that.
So thank you again to Dr. Platt, Dr. Posey, uh, Nishmat and Mizrahi Canada. Um, It's been really wonderful and we hope that we answered all your questions and we are always here for you if you have more. So thank you and have a great night, everybody. Wonderful, thank you. Have a good night.